Little Dave, thank you for coming today, man. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's been a long journey, man, and it's come to its final end. And you've been completely vindicated of being a confidential informant, uh, CI, rat. And uh, we had the first-hand experience of embedding with you throughout this eight-month trial held in Santa Ana at the federal courthouse. And I couldn't believe how thorough this judge was and how much long rope he gave Joe Yanni, who is representing the Mongols. But before we get into that trial, we need to get some context for our audience that involves the Mongols RICO trial where they were convicted of two counts of RICO. Right. And it was under the Doc Cavazos era during his presidency. Right. Tell our audience a little bit, because there's been some confusion that if you were a CI, that it led back to certain Mongols getting arrested right. in, in that trial, okay? Right. Tell us the, the, the exact cases those Mongols were involved in that couldn't even involve a CI, right? Right. Can there you, were, yeah. Can you go into that a little bit? Real, yeah, real quick, uh, just to correct you, it wasn't an eight-month trial. It was this last, I believe you're talking about the hearing. It Correct. was eight days total. Eight days, but it it went over, the, it started in Correct. December and then Correct. ended it just this month. That's yeah. right. The, the, with all the motions, the briefs, the rebuttals, all that. Correct. Um, as far as the original indictment, the charging indictment on the club came down in 2008. It was during the, the reign of Doc Cavazos, and uh, I had no contact with law enforcement. I wasn't any an, an officer at the time. I was uh, a nomad in a nomad chapter, and uh, I came back active into Harbor chapter for a while too, but as far as like the indictment or people getting arrested on their individual acts or selling dope or getting caught up, those were all individual acts by every individual. There were 79 defendants on the charging indictment for the RICO. And there was like different components to it. There was the forfeiture of the bikes. Uh, there was, uh, they were trying to, uh, you know, they put the injunction on the trademarks and subsequently trying to uh, basically uh, steal our uh, identity from us by way of the trademarks. Uh, there was other components. It was just, it was a very convoluted case, uh, had never been done before. It was just a novel approach by law enforcement and the government uh, to try to strip, of, tri strip us of our trademarks, which are collective membership marks, as I conveyed in our previous uh, uh, podcast with you. So uh, it was a culmination of everything coming to a head, a three-year investigation by four undercover uh, uh, ATF agents that infiltrated our club, again, under Doc's watch, Doc Cavazos. And um, it basically was dis... All the 79 defendants were charged, either took plea deals, found guilty, paid their debt to society, uh, did supervised release program, which is equivalent, you know, it's, it's, it's right. uh, parole. And uh, that was it. We thought that was going to be the end of it. Uh, as far as that was concerned, we were just going to fight for our trademark. So it became a First Amendment right issue and then uh, culminated into getting into a, uh, uh, a, a like a, it was like a superseding indictment. They had charged the club as a whole, Mongols Motorcycle Club, an unincorporated association. And that's how the club as as a whole got indicted. First time ever, never been done before. Right. Uh, novel approach again by the government. And to recap, you step in as international P for the Mongols, and now you've inherited this giant court case, right? Right. Um, just, <clears throat> there was a, after Doc Cavazos, there was two, two other presidents before me. It was within a year they were both gone. Uh, Largo took the reins, um, uh, and then uh, shortly after, October of 2008, 2008, the raids hit and he got swept in the raids. Then his cabinet leveled up. And when they leveled up, Martin Guevara, which was money, he, he stepped up and he was the appointed, not the sitting, 
be appointed or elected. He was this uh, appointed president for the next nine months up until the next election period. Right. And you discussed money. Money's a good cat, but he just didn't have the wherewithal to handle this this thing. And yeah, it's, and... yeah, it's, it was, it's a lot for anybody to swallow. Yeah. It's a big jagged pill to swallow. It's it was a lot of work, you know, and um, nobody could have ever foreseen what was going to transpire in the near future regarding what's going to go on with the patch. Because you got to remember, we were under a federal injunction not to wear our patch. Right. So a lot of people didn't understand what was going on. But to us, it was like you stripped us of our full identity. Right. We didn't have an identity at the time. But thank God the, the judge had some common sense and you guys are allowed to fly your colors. Right, I are. mean, fast forward to where we're at today, um, you know, Judge Cooper, she passed away and uh, uh, the court case got split up. Right. You know, 39 defendants went under uh, Judge Wright, the other defendants went under Judge Carter. So they basically split all the 79 defendants. Correct. Uh, well, some of them were at LA, you know, uh, federal courthouse and the other ones were down at Santa Ana federal courthouse under Judge Carter, who eventually ended up getting the whole case as far as the trademarks are right. concerned. He took it on. And and we got to see Judge Carter in action. He's an, <laughs> <laughs> he's an older white gentleman and he is a thorough judge, a no-nonsense guy. <laughs> he don't play. <laughs> he don't play, man. <laughs> we fast forward, to you, you've inherited this case now. The case gets, it's finalized. The Mongols have to pay a half a million dollars. Is that, was that correct? Yeah. So yeah. it was a big bill. Yeah, nobody was ever going to jail. That's why this, I don't understand why it wasn't tried civilly. And that's what a lot of people get confused. And I'm trying to like elaborate on why certain things were charged a certain way. Uh, and it should have been a civil case because nobody was going to jail. Obviously, if you ever catch a federal case, there's a defendant and obviously the uh, uh, when the case is finally adjudicated, somebody's going to jail or somebody's walking, bottom line. Right. Uh, but nobody was going to jail in this case. And that's why initially when Judge Carter took the case, it was it was brought to Santa Ana Federal Courthouse uh, regarding a related case because he had priors with the other defendants. Um, he dismissed it on First Amendment right issues. So then we went to the, the government, uh, took it under appeal. And after the appeal, they came back six months later and said, oh, no, we're going to give the government a chance to prove their case. And, you know, a few years later, we went to, we went to trial in 2018, October 30th, 2018. Okay. And that's when the trial started. Now, you got to remember, they were trying 10 acts of either hand-to-hand -hand buys with undercover agents. Uh, they, they were trying three murders um, and a bunch of other dope cases and some assaults, some stabbings. So it was 10 acts that they were retrying. Now you gotta remember, there was individuals that committed those acts that already went to prison for those acts. We were being tried as a club as a whole for those acts, including a couple of superseding uh, uh, acts that were like in 17 and 18, uh, 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 a murder of a, of a HA and uh, some, other, some other stuff that they, they threw in last minute. And um, that's why it wasn't so hard for the jury to convict on those acts because they were given video footage, security footage, where some dudes actually getting murdered or stabbed in the face. And, uh, you know, when jurors see that, it's, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't give a shit if Johnny Cochran comes out of the grave and comes to defense, you ain't gonna win. You know, the, the feds have a 98% conviction rate. Hardly anybody takes it to the box. We took it to the box because we had to. And, uh, you know, we were found, uh, we, we were convicted of two counts of RICO. One was a conspiracy of RICO, one was a RICO act. So, um, you know, it was, it, was easily, it was easily convictable, you know. I thought we would have a shot just on First Amendment right issues, but the jury saw it differently. And our punishment, nobody was going to jail. We had to pay a $500,000 fine, which from what I understand is fully paid now. Uh, it took uh, like a little, just over four years. And we had five years to pay it. Right. 
and we're looking at a court document for the racketeering acts correct and you see dope charges these are these are undercover <laughs> mongols yeah. selling to undercover agents um a gentleman was beaten and killed with a pool stick in a bar right uh, there was a Nicolas shooting where uh, some gang members got caught up in a in a shootout with Mongols. Correct. Uh, two HA prospects were stabbed at a mobile gas station. Yep. Another another uh, proven methamphetamine distribution act. All this stuff had nothing to do with anything but the hand in the cookie jar. Basically, and. There were some other things where, you know, some questionable acts possibly by ATF entrapment where there was a case where we had two of the brothers, uh, two, two of our club brothers, actually blood brothers, two Lozano brothers. And uh, they basically were, um, were asked, hey, by one of the undercover agents, uh, uh, Agent Carr, hey, will you pull security while I do this dope deal with this cartel dude? But it was all fictitious. Right. It was all just a ploy to get these brothers on tape. And I'm sitting in federal court watching this unfold at a, uh, at a hotel, uh, the Double Tree in Montebello. And they have the cameras in the corner and you, they're, putting on, uh, uh, they're putting on a bulletproof vest and have the straps. Well, it's easy to rope in a brother that is economically challenged per se. Right. And uh, it was a no-brainer for the juries to convict on stuff like that. Right. And you it's know? important to note that the ATF has had an open investigation with the Mongols for two decades now. Two decades, correct. They've been on correct. your ass for two decades. And we've been physically under indictment for 13 years. Yeah. So these are ongoing, deep investigations right. that predate your presidency. And they also demonstrate that these are hand and cookie jar moments. These are moments in time where um, there's nothing that can be done. You can't wiggle out of a hand to hand, uh, a, a murder caught on tape. There's nothing you could do. And they're well documented. They're well documented by video surveillance. They're documented by 302 notes, which how it works is when they're functioning throughout the day in the club, uh, with the club riding around doing their thing they're observing they're taking mental notes and they go home at night and write up their notes they're called 302 notes it's in the feds you know they right. everybody uses those notes so when it comes to either a jury trial or convictions or people taking plea deals these all, everything gets entered in as discovery as part of the case sure and so it's pretty damning evidence it's damning evidence there's no wiggle room you just take a deal and you're working now closely with joe yanni the club attorney he wasn't our attorney at the time. George Steele was. George Steele. George Steele is a great federal lawyer, and I built a really good relationship with him. He's honest. He actually did, the brother Sola from Montebello chapter, he actually did his case as part of the 79 defendants because he was working on the federal panel at the time. So you can't have two co-defendants uh, with uh, federal defenders from the same office. It's a conflict of interest. So what they do is they subcontract the work out to a private attorney, <clears throat> which is even better because you're getting private counsel and the government's paying for it. And George Steele was part of that uh, a federal defense panel and he actually caught the case and got it. So I ran into him and we started talking. He, he seeked me out. He knew we needed a new lawyer and we talked and he took the reins and uh, they dismissed it under Judge Carter with him. And the only reason we didn't rehire him, I didn't even know who Joe Yanni was, was the Vagos. We were heavily involved in the coalition of clubs for all motorcycle right. riders. And they recommended that we possibly interview him for possibly coming on, on board for the case. Uh, the upside to having him, and we all voted on it, was that the coalition of clubs was supposed to pay some of his retainer and you know some of his fees, okay. which really didn't happen. They paid as much as they could, but that kid was going elsewhere too to help people in Oklahoma, you know, other clubs over here on the East Coast. So money and funds were limited. So that's why I initiated after talking to everybody in the coalition of clubs to do this Save the Patch movement, STP we called it. Right. And uh, to do that, uh, move forward to, you know, typically raise money. And the checks were going directly to Joe after that. We voted. We didn't. It, it was just like, 
we had a choice, but we didn't. Either if we went with him, everybody was basically endorsing him. The Boggles were endorsing him. Other, uh, other members of the coalition. Hey, we picked this guy. He, you know, he's, that's he's a good. natural referral. Yeah. It's so okay. that's why we ended up going with them, and that's how they end. That's how the relationship formed, and that's how we moved forward with it. And uh, it wasn't our first choice, but it was a choice we had because there was people that are paralegals in the coalition of clubs and they were offering assistance and Joel was willing to accept their assistance at first and towards you know towards kind of going to trial and doing paperwork he was refusing the assistance and I couldn't understand why and he just basically was just wanted to do his own thing and use his own people which was fine but he didn't really adhere to a lot of the guidelines from the beginning you know he just kind of did his own thing i didn't think he wanted people in his business is what it was right but you started to see some red flags while working with yanni and one of those was he actually hit you up to borrow money correct right uh wow <laughs> Yeah, it, it was... Uh, Didn't you find that a little odd? Why would an attorney yeah, ask a client to... Well, since we're going, we're going there now, let's talk about it. What happened was, we started trial October 30th, 2018. We had paid him probably close to almost $400,000 and some change. He basically called me like three or four months before trial started and said, look, man, I, I need my last 100,000. And I showed you the bill to, to corroborate that. And the, the bill said, you know, 100,000 balance due, but it was wiped out at a zero. And he was basically, because guess what? After trial, if he don't get his money, we could just basically tell him, you know what? Fuck off, we ain't paying you the rest. Right. So he was smart in that respect. Sure. So we gave him that 100 racks. We gave it to him like maybe a couple of months before trial started. Literally the first or second day, he goes, hey, Dave, can I borrow three, you know, some money? They're going to turn out the lights at my office. And I found that odd. And I was just like, well, okay. I go, let me see what I could do. You know, he didn't give me a dollar amount he wanted. I just came up with a dollar amount the following day. I gave him three grand cash. I said, look, this is for me. I go, get keep the lights on. I go, I don't want you worrying anything about your personal finances because it fucks you up in the head. You know, if your mind's not right and you're focusing your attention on finances, you're not giving me 100% in the courtroom. So I gave it to him. You know, I was worried. Hey, we're starting off on the wrong foot here. You know, you spent the money. We gave you the last $100,000. That should have been plenty to get you through the next four months with no issues, you know. So I gave him that money thinking, oh, he's going to pay me back in a couple of weeks. Well, he hits me up and asks me, hey, Dave, I, I need more money. Do you have anybody that can lend me 25 grand? I'll pay him 10 on top of that. This is an attorney asking a client yeah. for money. I mean, red right. flag city, bro. Super. I started getting worried. I'm like, man, this dude was asking for 25 grand. That's a lot of money, you know? I don't have that kind of money on me. So I was just like, I told him, look, man, I'll, I'll let you know by tomorrow. I know somebody that might lend you. One of my club brothers has a, a, a business that's thriving. I go, let me ask him, you know, I, I don't want your, I want your head to be right. You know, I need 110% for me. So a couple days went by, dude said, yeah. The brother said, yeah, I'll lend it to him, but I want my money back within a three, four weeks tops. And I told Joe, I go, bro, you got to give it back to him. Plus that interest you're saying you're paying. He, he made the interest. I didn't, you know, he put 10 on it, 10 points on it. You know what I mean? So I was just like, cool, fuck it. So he was given a check. He cashed the check. And I kept hounding him for the money. Fuck my money at this point. Just get the brother back his money. So Joe hands me a check one day, maybe about, I don't know, a month through the trial. He goes, $3,000. You got it. I showed it to you. The, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's up intact. It's up behind you now. Yeah, it's intact. <laughs> I go to the bank. I bank at the same bank. They go, there's no funds in there. I'm like, fuck, man, this guy got me. So the next day I said, hey, bro, they said there's no funds. And why are you giving me a check if there's no funds? So I go, oh, no, I, I'm having some issues right now. I'm having some issues. And I, I know what the issues were, you know, cause he confided in me later and I was like, whatever, fuck it. You know, just pay my boy his money, that's it. You know, I vouch, you don't pay, I gotta pay. So another week goes by, he gives me a check for five grand. And it's not made out to me, it's made out to my club brother's company. You have the check, <laughs> it bounced for five grand. 
Now, it's put a wedge in our relationship. We're in the middle of fucking trial. I don't even want to sit next to him. I'm so fucking angry and frustrated. But you can't switch counsel midstream. You can't. just can't. We're in trial. Yeah. So he gave me, like, bro, it was bad. So we go outside in the hallway during break, and I just start ripping on him, bro. He's trying to fuck him. Walk down the hallway. He's running down the hallway, trying to open up other courtroom doors just to get the fuck away from me because I'm fucking yelling at him. I'm mad. I'm frustrated. The brother's blowing up my phone. What do you want me to do? You know what I mean? I'm answering him. I got to answer to him. So he gives me, I have 64 texts that I printed out that I showed you. They're in that book. They're all here. They're all you pressing up on Joe and Joe saying, I know it's not right. I'm sorry. Working on it, meaning working on getting the money, even at this minute. It should all be finished this week. It involves things out of my control. Those folks didn't appreciate the urgency. Dealing with court seven days a week, 18 hours per day didn't help. So he's coming up with excuse after excuse, 64 different excuses of why he can't pay back this money. Right. Now, it, what doesn't make sense is you guys gave him money, 100K. He should be well healed. How, how did you guys pay him with a check or? We paid him cash. So Every time. He over, had a duffel, over, over half a million dollars in cash. So Joe had a duffel bag of $100,000 in cold cash, right? Yeah. Well, why did he want a cash payment? That's odd for an attorney. Uh, he has, okay, well, you brought that can of worm up. I mean, you, you opened up Pandora's box, I should say. Um, there's evidence right there. <laughs> he owes the IRS a lot of money. He, you know, the IRS, you know, put a levy on his accounts. So they were garnishing all yeah, the, everything so. that the, everything that went into his account they were taking. But and but he had the why didn't he just pay the IRS? That's that's I don't know. I have no clue. None of my business. That's his business. But it put us in a bad position where like I'm trying to I'm trying to get a win out of this case, and I'm trying to make sure this guy's giving it his all. But in the same token, there's animosity and hatred going on towards this guy. And just pissed at him for not fucking doing the right thing and paying back my club brother's money. And the reason we're talking about this is because it comes out later down the road in my my hearing. He had an axe to grind with me, and we'll get to that. But this is setting up why we're talking about it because it's all making sense now. Why Joe had a little exactly. Yeah. So he basically basically he didn't pay. So guess who has to pay? I vouch. You do. Exactly. So I gave my brother, I sold my gold Dinah. I got that done. I gave him 25 grand cash. Here, here's 25 grand. I would have thought the brother wow. would have said, fuck the interest. You got, at least got me my money. He still wanted his interest. I don't blame him. I don't blame him either. Yeah. And I, I brought this to Joe's attention. I can bait it to him many times. I go, look, man, I don't know why I have to pay your fucking debt. You know what I mean? I, I vouch for you. You said you, you promised me. And he didn't come through, so wow. guess who's got to pay? I got to pay. So total, I paid out was thirty five grand. I Damn. lost the three grand, Damn. basically. So but I was you... out of my own fucking pocket. And you know what's crazy is because my whole chapter knew about it. The whole cha Bobby D Santos, they all knew about what what I was going through. And this is one of the reasons why we fired him shortly. And there's an email that we sent him through Stubbs that we fired him because of that reason. And it's documented. I have all my shit's documented. Right. So Dave, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, the Cinemills production team embedded with you during this new motion to vacate the old RICO trial based solely on one focus. Was little Dave a government informant? That's the focus. That, that was simply it. And boy, did Judge Carter overturn every stone. How'd you feel you did on stand? I think I did great. I yeah. answered the questions accordingly and with honesty and, and I think we're, we're, we're good. I noticed he was trying to connect you to the Black Rain investigation and it just, he was kind of drawing out straws. Right, I mean, it, it's, it's just bringing up the past, the indictment and everything, but it wasn't on my reign side little or no knowledge of what went on during Black Rain, so it wasn't, you know, during my time of reign, so I'm not concerned. I think in the end I'll be vindicated. I noticed there were some brothers in court and Judging by some of their reactions, I could tell they were kind of like, eh, 
there's no, no smoking gun here. Yeah, there really isn't. Um, he's grasping at straws. He just, he, everything that he's brought up has been refuted by either court document, you know, court documents, you know, especially some of my cases, but I'm confident uh, this afternoon will go just as smooth and just, you know, get this done and out of the way. He looked into everything and gave Joe Yanni so much rope, so much latitude, and you had nobody objecting on your behalf. You were thrown to the wolves, so to say, <laughs> right? Because the prosecution... They're, they're not my friends. They're not your friends. They they, they, they have no love for you. So they, oh, they None. Zero. Zero. So you were kind of this third party dangling in the wind, bro. You know, it, it was the worst. I'm going to tell you this. Go ahead. Well, I want to I want to just read directly from the court transcripts. Retired ATF special agent John Sacconi, retired Montebello officer Christopher Cervantes, <laughs> the infamous, the infamous Cervantes yeah. that you, you you that was three years retired and you were photographed having a beer with him at a bowling alley for right. your granddaughter's birthday, who just so happened to be there. ATF supervisory special agent Susan Rachel all testified that it is not true that you were a confidential informant. Um, Montebello Police Officer S Sergeant Omar Rodriguez, Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, Ivana Farias, the Long Beach Police Department, Sergeant Jared Lewis, also testified that they conducted thorough searches and there are absolutely no records of any agreements with Little Dave. FBI Special Agent, Joey Talamantes testified as well and said that you were not an un, in, uh, unidentified co-conspirator number 38, as Joe Yanni tried to throw out there. You were not an un, 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 in, a, a cor, uh, unidentified co-conspirator number 39. This was all to smut your good name. And those two, by the way, those two UICCs, as, as the court refers to them as, we're doing time in LA County Jail, so right. you were not in LA County Jail. No, nah. one, you know. So the, the under oath through the most thorough, thorough investigation, you were completely vindicated of any wrongdoing, of betraying your brothers, and we all know that in the streets and in the one percenter world, paperwork's everything. When you show up on a on a prison yard, am I correct by saying you have to have your paperwork, bro? 100%. Now, my big question to you, Dave, is if I accuse someone of being a rat and it is found out they are not, what happens to me on well, a prison yard? You get, you get rat packed or no pun intended. <laughs> Or you get a knife in your neck, like it's some serious. Uh, that's a serious uh, crime to be accusing, you know, somebody of being uh, an informant or a rat. You know, basically you have that paperwork. And at this point, you know, Joe Yanni saw it as a way to monetize on my sure my issue, my marital issue. And he went to the court while the, I mean, he went to the uh, club. And the club was in a vulnerable state. I was not there present during this sit down with Joe. And obviously Joe Yanni had an ax to grind with me because number one, he lost that case fair and square. He was never prepared any day of the week on that case. The government brought their A game like they had been fucking preparing this case for 13 fucking years, which they were. Um, you know, that St Steven Stubbs came in he wasn't there the whole time. He came in partially midway through the case because he lives out of state. Uh, they did a pro temp, hawk, a hawk pro temp or whatever for, for him to be on the case, sitting in the courtroom as a lawyer because he's not uh, licensed here in California. He's licensed out of the state of Nevada. So the judge granted that. And they'll do that once in a while. They do it with people like that once in a while. But he was my only person I could really confide in during the case because 
my relationship with Joe Yanni during trial because of the money issues. Soured. Soured big time. He drove such a wedge between us that I wouldn't even sit next to him in court anymore. I wasn't passing them notes anymore. I was so frustrated with them and disgusted in him on how unethical and how unprofessional this man could be. You know, it just, it was just bad for business. It was a bad look. And it ended up being worse towards the end when they hit us with the fine. Uh, Steven Stubbs uh, delivered a uh, letter of candor which means, hey, there's a debt owed to the club by this lawyer that's sitting next to him, and we want that taken off the $500,000 as part of debt that he owes. And the judge wasn't buying it, and I didn't blame the judge for buying it. It was a personal thing, and the federal government isn't a collection agency. Right, they're not an know? escrow officer. Yeah. Exactly. So it didn't sit well with me him still owing money and i still had to go through the fucking probation process <sighs> come to find out when we went on probation he was trying to pass off uh and i showed you the uh invoice for the last hundred thousand balance paid done so he tried to pull an okie doke and a fast one on probation and said we owe 511 now after trial so it would negate the $500,000 fine that was, you know, put on us by Judge Carter, you know? So this is the type of character we're dealing with here. Lots of janky moves, bro. Super. Yeah. And I wouldn't speak on it if I didn't have factual uh, paperwork to support it or back it up. And it's all right there. We have it Anybody all. wants it, they have it. We have it's, it all. It's... It's sad that it's come to this. And somebody with that much experience in, you know, dealing with the law and being ethical. And, you know, he took an oath. And, uh, you know, I'm sure he'll have some issues in, in the near future regarding that because that's what bar complaints are for. Mm -hmm. Not only that, it's, you know, for other stuff that I have on him. So we'll see what happens in the near future yeah, Joey. on that issue. Dave was good on the stand just now or oh I don't talk about good or bad uh, you know it's uh, more just more will be revealed okay what, what more is that because you guys went over the declarations all oh, the I statements? can't I can't get into what uh, more I'm gonna be revealing but um, just stay tuned but it, it seems like he wasn't working with Sacconi that's what we got from it as we sat in court today if you believe what he says you're gonna believe what you think okay. um, uh, just stay tuned because more will be revealed okay we're just focusing on the facts a little bit like so I can't get into that okay. with you, you know, I, I, I can't just just okay. sit in the audience get some popcorn yeah we're, we're, we've been watching it closely who's up next on the on the stand you did Annie earlier and now you've got you did Dave are you gonna continue well, I'm not done with Dave yeah we're not done by a long shot yeah. Joe Yanni used he, he's an opportunist that was able to drag your name through the mud yeah in conjunction with current Mongol administrative guys, right. the current officers that use this moment in time to dethrone you. Everyone kind of knows that story. And, and a lot of the comments we read have tilted in your favor because a lot of people jumped out the window on you, man. And, <laughs> and you're, <Right. laughs> you're owed apologies, but unfortunately, um, a fellow YouTube content creator, Insane Throttle. Oh, yeah. Really, uh, you know, I have to call him out because instead of apologizing to you when the paperwork was revealed that you have no connection to any law enforcement and you weren't a CI, instead of saying, hey, I want to I want to redact some statements, which he should have, he doubled down on this whole thing. You know what? Uh, I'm still trying to figure it out. You know, initially when I talked to him and I went on his platform, I went on his platform straight out of just frustration. I was just trying to reach out to uh, the biker community. And I know he has quite a bit of subscribers. And, uh, you know, I really didn't know anything about that gentleman, you know, I, initially. I didn't know anything really. I was reaching out. You know, American Cholo did me a solid. Uh, they, 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 they basically, you know, touched yeah. on the case according to facts. You know, I presented them with facts and paperwork. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if it was my abrupt, uh, you know, just cutting it short and 
uh, not finishing that segment with him, but I just couldn't go on because he was trying to ambush me on shit that we didn't even be talking about. Like even during, um, you know, all his segments are just, just he just just browbeating me on shit that, like he has this personal uh, vendetta towards me. I don't know what I ever did to him. Um, I think one of the things he got upset with me about that, um, I gave him up regarding who sent him the video initially and it was bobby d he admitted it to me and i think that's one of the reasons he got a, a little ir irritated because i said it on one of the podcasts and i don't care everybody knew bobby d sent that you know it was sent to santos which is the sitting president now you're he got talking to the in. video about annie yeah. yeah 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 it was gonna go in it was gonna go online anyway he right? published yeah. it and he talked on it and uh, whatever uh, I mean, some of the stuff he was telling me that he, he told me he was a one percenter before he, he after I come to find out he never was. Um, I don't even honestly like I don't dislike him. I just think he's just a bad man. Like, you know what I mean? Like, admit you were wrong yeah. and just safe face. Like, you, right. who cares? I mean, what's the big deal? He, he, he's he's so insistent on, on, on staying in pocket and good with the club that he doesn't want to go down that road per se like but who do, cares do you think joe yanny's in his ear oh 100 yeah. percent. okay so during the this whole eight days of what i would call a mini trial it wasn't even a hearing it was like a fucking trial joe yanny was getting every court day because it went from june all the way to october we'd go like two days this this month right. another day this month maybe a few hours this day like it, it was eight days of it and every time he did a show, he would be revealing some new stuff. No smoking gun, just the same, right, just gossip, regurgitating yeah. the right. same shit over and over, trying to amplify the issues yeah. to his advantage. Yeah. It got old. You know, people are getting sick of it. It was like, yeah. all right, here we go again. David right. bashing day. Right. It's like he brings no nothing to the table. There's new. nothing there. It's there's just, there's nothing yeah. there anymore. There's nothing of substance. Yeah. Now we're waiting. Oh, we're waiting for the transcripts. You're not going to get the transcripts. Uh, bottom yeah. line. I think he was quoted saying, Judge Carter's leaving no stone he unturned. Did. And it's like, well, if you feel that way in St. Throttle, it, it ha what's good for the goose has to be good for the gander, meaning stand by your word, stay on the square, yeah. man, and just say, hey, listen, I jumped out the window. And you know what, Dave? A lot of people jumped out the window. Um, and, and I have to admit, the Annie video, it, it's funky, bro. It's, it's hard to kind of conceptualize unless you break it down you add in that you were you, you know inebriated at the time yeah. and trying to get your wife back and man she could have done you know you hear about women th burning their dude's clothes you hear about them <laughs> cleaning their cars you know what better way to stick a knife in you than to suggest you're a ci right you know there's no better way to yeah, do that scum of the earth it's, bottom of the barrel it's, it's, you want to kill a biker career that's how you do it oh, yeah. you know what i mean <laughs> Uh, to to put it to put it lightly, right? But uh, yeah, I mean, this guy keeps. I mean, his views are so low that I can't even believe he just keeps beating this dead horse. You know, I won fair and square because this case wasn't really about government misconduct. They was trying to flush me out as being a fucking allegedly being a rat. Okay, right. and still to this day, he still can't fathom the fact that you know the judge ruled in my favor. And he just keeps going on and on about, well, he's probably one of those secret. Right. Uh, it, I mean, come informants. on, dude. Bro, there's no such thing as this guy is not on the payroll and this guy's not working off a right. case. It's black and white. Black. There's no gray area. Right. Either you are or you're not. Now, what refutes and debunks everything he's saying is that you had two people from ATF, including a supervisor. And John, it wasn't just John Saccone saying I wasn't. Right. It was an FBI agent who was uh, he who came who uh, he sure. came in because of another ongoing case from another organization out of the federal courthouse that they wrote me in on on a subpoena because I was the sitting president at the time when an alleged incident took place. I'm not going to get into that organization's name or anything because it doesn't need to be said. I don't speak on other people, and I just want. I just wanted to reiterate that because some of the stuff that he's saying is so silly and I can't even believe people would even entertain it. It's just, it's silly and it's laughable. And I think people have stopped entertaining it and it's, you know, you, you've been completely vindicated, you know, 
and you know a third of the way into the trial uh we we approached joe yanni mm -hmm. and we said joe what's going on man we're not seeing anything where's your smoking gun and, right and joe yanni had no smoking gun however as i look back at the trial he pulls out this steve stubbs stephen stubbs right, right. bow tie stubbs right yeah yeah and you know bow tie stubbs steve stubbs was i think his secret weapon that he thought he had you know <laughs> <laughs> bro that was a debacle total debacle man explain to our audience what steve stubbs really is he's a pi attorney right personal injury guy i'm glad you brought that up so steve stubbs has always asserted that he is <laughs> The International General Counsel for the Mongols Motorcycle Club. I'm laughing because I find it humorous that he was an international and he's his license to practice law is in Vegas, Nevada or Nevada. But what cracks me up even more because when I first met him at the, the Coalition of Motorcycle Clubs, the, the Coalition of Clubs, COC, he was heavily involved, okay? Biker profiling, all this. You know, he's a do-gooder. But his expertise are tax... We're, 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 he's a tax attorney. His card it, read tax solutions. Okay. It's like 11 years ago or 10 years ago. I'm laughing because you don't know the Steven Stubbs I know. He's the biggest fucking dumbest dork that I know. Okay. But you know what? He's an he odd chap. On yeah. you. He grows yeah. on you. He's cool. Well, he was, right? So he ended up coming on to our case and he's a personal injury attorney. Okay, he came on our case. We've never, we've never paid him a retainer. He's always worked pro bono, and I respected him for that a lot because he did put forth time to help certain brothers on, 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 on. Uh, we got a bunch with some of, free legal. He, yeah, yeah, bro, he helped a bunch of brothers out with jaywalking tickets when we had a fucking uh, a national run in Boulder City, Nevada. And, you know, the cops didn't want us there. He facilitated the hotel and facil facilitated talks with the cops just to fucking get out from one of those tickets when we went to court. I was about the extent of it. You know, he's like one of those, uh, like, you know, when I had him in court, it was cool because I wasn't talking a joke. Right. So, so I would <laughs> talk to him. I would talk to him, you know, to get messages to Joe. That's how bad it got. It got really hostile with us. I just, I wanted to kill him. But Steven Stubbs is like a comfort uh, a comfort dog on a plane. He's just there to, you know, comfort your way it. through shit. You know what I mean? It's like, I can't explain any other way. You know, he's fun. He rides. You know, I respect him for riding. He rides okay. a lot. And like the HAs and the Vogs all know he's our attorney, like our hangaround attorney because we never paid him. And it's just nice having an attorney with right. you, you know. Yeah, he, a mouthpiece yeah. that will willing to get arrested, which he has, uh, not just for standing up for bikers, but his integrity was questioned and he was convicted of, uh, uh, about right before trial started, uh, for, uh, uh, was it fraud? Yeah, it was fraud. Um, he, uh, he got caught for signing people to, to DUI clients signing because he's a notary sign, signing their plea agreements with their signatures and he got caught. And he got convicted. And I believe his license was suspended for a while for it. So that's why I couldn't understand why Joe Yanni was bringing him up, but I can understand why now they got together. And you sure. know, he perjured himself on the stand many times big that time, day. Big time, big time. I mean, lied about everything. The, the, Still lying to this day about shit. Like giving reports on how much the club makes. Motherfucker, you ain't the treasure. You know your name from the club. He's never seen the books. He's an of idiot, this club. dude. He just talks out of the yeah. side of his neck. You don't but, even know what the he, fuck he's he, talking he about. He really got he really got co cozy with the Mongols. He kind of was yeah. the dork that that wanted to hang out with all the bad yeah. boys and be yeah. cool. But you know the lines blur when you do that. You you kind of violate a professional, you know, Chinese wall between you and the club. And and when you start drinking with the boys and hanging out. You know the lines blur a little bit and um 
you know, he, he got so comfortable. He Wasn't he kind of stooping some of the hang around girls? Yeah, I mean, dude, I mean, we got photos of that dude being, being a weirdo. Uh, women were just repulsed by him. They just could, they, they're just like, this is a guy, he's like a fucking horny lawyer that's never seen pussy in his life. You know what I mean? <laughs> he's just running around with his dick. Hey, hey, can I fuck one of Annie's cousins? Or, hey, can I do this? Like, do this? Like, Are you serious? Yeah, bro, he's a fucking weirdo. Yeah. Like, and like a sexual deviant. Like, no I don't kidding. know, it's weird. I've never seen a Mormon like that. You know what I mean? Maybe he's a Jack Mormon, dude. Maybe, I don't know. But I'm but sure. But we have photos to support that too. So we're, we're not saying nothing out of line or defaming his character no. we've got letters and photos regarding right. that well i'm sure his wife doesn't appreciate all that yeah but yeah that's a whole other story he you know he sent you a text back in september 7th of 2021 where he writes i just heard that all the Mongols members are ordered not to talk to me or use my devices any longer. There's some rumor going around that i was with Mongols members when they talked to cops and hit it from the club I don't know what they're talking about, Steve Stubbs writes. Um, so he was he was kind of booted out of the club at one point, correct? Right. So he wasn't allowed to hang around. So now now anybody that's okay. So that video went on in July. I did that podcast on American Troller where he just said, Yeah, Dave's not a snitch. And he got he got shitted on for it. You get me? So uh, anybody that came to my defense was or getting said, hey, yeah, was excommunicated. Right. And that's, you know, the, the, the club administration, not the club, because the club has nothing to do with it. It's the administration that's running the show right now. Correct. They were the ones that basically put it out that, hey, anybody fucks with Dave or talks to Dave, you're out, you're done. Whether but, you're a hang around, a groupie, a turnout, a lawyer. So. But that's how coups work, Dave. Right? Exactly. You, 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 you kill all the families and the newborn children of the, the past dynasty, right? And that's that's kind of what occurred, right? Exactly what occurred. You know, throwing out brothers out bad because they were supporters of me. And it's sad, but it's true. And to redeem himself, to get back in the club's good graces, Joe Yanni subpoenaed him to come and be a witness in the trial, a defense witness, right, for the for the club. And that's what his whole premise behind coming over there. Okay. He didn't want to do it. He was reluctant, but he did it. To get back in. And guess what? He's back in. Is he? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, so it worked. And him coming, you know, he went on Insane Throttle recently. I watched the video. I didn't I get was to see him. that. Yeah, because yeah. they pulled it right away. Why'd they pull it? Because he sat there and just lied about shit. And I think he got cold feet after and just fucking, they made him take it off. You know what I mean? And he just lied. Like, I don't speak on me. Don't speak on my old lady. He was making inflammatory remarks, fucking disparaging comments about my wife and me. I'm like, fuck yourself, motherfucker. You don't know me like that. You can't speak on me. You know what I mean? And, he, and so I texted him while he was interviewing on the show because it was live. And I said, you're a fucking liar. So during the process, he, oh, Lil Dave just texted me. He's calling me a fucking liar. Yeah, <laughs> you're a fucking liar. Yeah. You get me? Yeah. You're, and, you're sucking the club's dick that hard that you have to fucking lie and shit on yeah. me? And what a, what, there's something called an attorney-client privilege that's exactly. totally been violated. But, but but let's talk about the two lies that Stubbs said. First, he said you were jacking 80 grand from the club, on, bro. bro. 80, I could see five, four, <laughs> 80 thousands noticeable, dude. I they, mean. It's so stupid, right? It doesn't make sense. And Bobby D's running around telling everybody in, in president meetings, oh, Menace and Dave stole millions and millions of the motherfucker. We don't even make millions of dipshit. Mil million never flowed exactly. through. Exactly. Yeah. So, so yeah. there's brothers that are listening and like, bro, we know this is all bullshit. You know what right. I mean? Because they, they know what we bring in. Yeah. It's... And we're paying fines and lawyer fees and appellate this and, you know, clubhouse this. And, bro, that shit adds up quick. Bro, you you count the Mo Mongol membership numbers, which we won't disclose. You times that by the monthly, and there you have you understand what the cash flow of, of the entity. All all clubs are that way. Yeah. One percenters, non one percenters, they collect membership dues, and those dues flow into an account. Yeah, legals paid, shits paid. It's it's not it's not hard. It, it, it's not hard to. It's hard to to steal cash out of those kitties, right? You know what I mean. I want to uh, touch on that real quick because I'm not the treasurer. 
you have manos and you have rags, they all touch your money. They're like, oh, well, there's only 12 grand. Well, where's the rest of it, idiots? There was more. Because Rags is a thief, too. Caught that, caught that brother stealing twice already. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah okay. So we got, yeah. I got brothers that could corroborate that, too. It's just like, I, I don't want to get into yeah, business let's like stop. that. Yeah. I just want to just keep. They, they pushed a false narrative. It didn't go their way. It blew up in their face. Uh, let's talk about another lie Stubbs brought up. He said, yeah. you, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. You met with John Ciccone every morning at Starbucks right. Coffee. Come on, dude. Exactly. Now you did meet you did see John Ciccone at Starbucks. And because we were there at that courthouse, I want our audience to understand this. There in the court the courthouse is isolated in this part of Santa Ana. Right. It's not in the mix, so to say. It's it and so when you break, you have three options. A Starbucks, a little Mexican cantina, and this is afternoon. Right, in the afternoon. And there's a Chinese spot, right? A little, another, I think or something so. like, like that. There's just three, spot. there's three choices You're you can limited. have. But before noon, there's one place to go and everyone gets their coffee at Starbucks. Yeah. And up behind you is a little, a little map showing how, how you have three options. There used to be a court cafeteria post COVID, they closed it. Mm -hmm. So now at Starbucks, it's not uncommon to see reporters, Department of Homeland Security, defendants, plaintiffs, prosecutors, staff, janitorial, paralegals, everybody grabs their morning coffee before they go to the courthouse. Marshals, jurors. Mar everybody's there, which they got to change that, bro, because if there's jurors there, yeah. you know, it's just, it's messy, but it's the only, it's the only gig in town. So tell us the day you, you, you were at a Starbucks with, was mm -hmm. it with Annie? You're, you guys are getting your morning coffee and Ciccone's mm -hmm. there, right? Right. And you said, what's up to him? That was it. That was it. You're like, hey, we bro, what's up? we were waiting for our coffee. You only, you wait in this little area. It's super small Starbucks. Yeah. It, just shooting the shit. Just, yeah, just, just hey, just we'll whatever. see you in court, like, dude. Yeah. And I guess the jury seen it as being kind of weird. Why is he talking to him? You know what I mean? Right. But, you know, we got admonished in the courtroom, you know, out of the presence of the jury. And it was that. That was it. Little, it was yeah. just like, I, it was just like obviously, hey, guys, Judge, uh, Judge Carter didn't care. He was just like, hey, I've got brought to my attention. Because I don't care who you talk to, but it's not a good look to the jury. You know, if you want to win this case right. or do whatever, but whatever. It's, it, it really yeah. didn't play a factor on us winning or losing. And after we were admonished, never happened again. I avoided that place like the plague. You know, or I went there when, you know, just go in and go out. I got in trouble for saying hi to the jurors or, hey, have a good Christmas or have a good Thanksgiving. Yeah, like, I'm just a friendly guy. Yeah. I'm just like, you know, I was trying to humanize the but, club through me. I'm the right. face of the club, but I'm humanizing it to the club. Like, hey, right. the guy's not too bad trying to, you know. I mean, well, obviously it didn't work. We got convicted. <laughs> but, you, know, you but, know, fuck, I get an A for effort. But, you know, my, my intentions were always yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, there weren't, you know, and people know that people understand that. And, you know, let's now talk about when we were sitting in court, we noticed there were some Mongol brothers there. Um, was anybody there from the administration, from the core um, administration? Sadly, no. Sadly, no. They brought this frivolous, what I call a frivolous motion with no merit to back it. And, and it's sad if you feel that strongly that I was a confidential informant, why aren't you sitting every day in court? You're the new face of the club. You don't want to show your face. You don't want to take the time. They have flexible schedules. Santos don't even work. So, and he's their number one now. One of them should have been there, right? Why isn't Bobby D there? When all this shit hit the fan, that's why Bobby D has such a hard on with for me because he teamed up with Joe Yanni, another guy that owed me money, had an ax to grind with me. I want to give everybody the full perspective on how and why everything came to a head because of these two jokers, literally. They call him Joker because he's a joke. <laughs> that's Bobby D. So that's what his club name is. So, so it just, they teamed up together and had an ax to grind with me. And they teamed up. And that's why I ended up in federal court fighting that motion. Uh, this all could have been handled in, in, a, in a setting behind closed doors with certain members of the club, including mother chapter and presidents. Right. And it would have all been refutable and debunked and corroborated with facts that I have. 
because initially when they put it put forth that paperwork that motion in place it was just like oh he didn't do a day in jail he didn't he got arrested but never convicted on all those charges of those assaults and this this and that when in fact all my cases have been adjudicated except one that i'm still pending in indio yeah. court for that assault with a deadly yeah. weapon that they filed on me and I didn't even know they filed yeah. on me. I'd been having a warrant for fucking four right. years and the only reason I found out was because New York Times called me when they were doing the article and they go, Dave, we were doing our fact checking as journalists do because they don't want to get sued. So they called the courts on all my cases, found out there was dispositions on a bunch of them except for the one in India and yeah. I'm like, hey, you gotta, so I, I recently hired a lawyer uh, right. and we Mario cut, Rodriguez yeah. out of fucking Riverside and he's defending me on that case and uh, you know I just, took my just, medicine yeah. I took, took no, it on the chin yeah. all my cases that was all proven that was it all was proven, proven. In, in court and, and it was proven be, when we pulled your pacer we saw that you, you had to take it on the chin for all these things oh, fuck yeah but that's how Yanni entered this that's how he exactly. muddied the waters that was his strategy oh right. dave did do any time on a dui the santa yeah. anita thing the palm springs beer incident yeah. all that stuff was you know stuff that you got you wiggled out of by reduced uh you know they w w when they charge you they always charge you the full magilla and then right. you know if you lawyer up you can get it reduced and stuff but you paid your dues on all that stuff yeah what's so crazy and so laughable is that joe yanni made it seem like i got away with murder all these i got nothing happened to me right then when I proved to them in federal court that I had on my paperwork, because the judge asked for it, now the, the narrative is like, oh, well, they were lenient on him. Oh, is that the new twist? Yeah, that's the new, oh, but they were lenient on him. Well, on first offender program on a DUI, which mine was, I got more, I got 117 hours community service plus a bunch of other shit. I got, I got yeah. it the worst. So there was no leniency. Yeah. So when that false narrative didn't work out for them, now they're going, oh, well, he's, he stole money. Like, come on, right. bro, what is it? And then the It just it never it, ends. Yeah, no, that never ended. And then I guess Joe Yanni's secret weapon, he always, you know, his smoking gun, I guess, was Steve Stubbs. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, I mean, you're really drawing at straws here, dude. So real quick on that, every time we finished in court, the judge asked him, what witnesses are you bringing? He'd be shuffling papers. Oh, I'm gonna bring this guy, let me bring, you know. Bro, you're just bringing just fucking anybody with a pulse just to drag this out more so you can get compensated and monetized on the club for all that money. Yeah, how much, you know? did, how much do you think he made on that? Uh, 150, Damn. 150 to vindicate me, thank you. And I said that, I you said, said that, that I remember last you said, time, yeah. thank you for, you're gonna vindicate me, Right. thank you. It was tough because I had to deal with this shit hanging over my head for 16 months. And oh, um, to get it out of the way and over with and be vindicated was the best thing because I didn't have to do it. The court and the judge did it for me right. and then and, and the, the, the club brought it on. And, right. you know, unfortunately, it blew up in their it face. And, and it's not the face club, and the... it's the administration. Right. It blew up in their face. 150,000, thank you for the vindication. That's how much it costs to vindicate you, which is so sad because there's nothing to vindicate you for. You you always played the game right. And, you know, the, the, the other thing, you know, a lot of people don't understand is you don't want to be on this platform. You no. never wanted to speak about this. And you never threw this thing out in the air, man. They did. I'm glad you brought that up, and I want to touch on that real quick. There was guys like in St. Throttle Hollywood or whatever, and I hate to mention his name because th that voice just irks me, but he was going around telling everybody now, well, he didn't take the stand before, but he's taking it now, and, uh, you know, why would he do that? And, you know, why would I do it? Why wouldn't I do that? This case isn't about the Rico anymore. This case is about you. It's about me. And you're, you're bringing, you know, this motion that I'm cooperating and divulging uh, defense strategy to the government, which is a bold faced lie, because there was no strategy every day. Joe Yanni was shooting off the hip. Even Steven Stubbs can, can, can attest to that because 
he was just like, dude, his closing arguments on our RICO, he waited till the government did theirs and then he jotted down notes and then did presented his. Totally winging it. Exactly. Steven Stubbs told me that. So for him to go on a, uh, uh, you know, up on the stand and lie about everything, it's it, it just, just sad. But I'm not, I could have sat there on the advice of counsel because Jim Blatt helped me out through. He's a great federal attorney. He was kind of coaching me through stuff. And thank you, Jim, for always helping me. Shout out to James uh, Blatt. Yeah. One of the best, by far, one of the best federal lawyers out here in Cali. He, 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 he helped me get through this process because I was at a disadvantage. I didn't have a lawyer that could be there on the stand. Don't say this, yeah. say this. Don't, you know, it was just me by myself, me against an army. And basically, if I would have been inclined to, uh, on advice of counsel, plead the fifth, right? You know, invoke my fifth amendment right privilege, everybody would have said, he's guilty. Well, but because I spoke my truth on the stand more than once, I was up on that fucking stand like three, four times because I had to get getting called. I spoke my truth and I said what it was. And, and, and my story was the same every fucking single time because it was the truth. If I would have sit there and invoke my fifth, they would have been like, oh, you would have gotten barbecue. I, I would have got shit yeah. on. And oh, that- he has something to hide. I ain't got nothing to hide. I went on my own accord too. Supposedly, Joe Yanni says he subpoenaed me. I never got the subpoenas, but I knew that because I was tracking everything on Tracer and uh, everything was on, on, on journalists were, were writing about it and the media was involved. You know, Channel 7 News was always there. New York Times was there. LA Times, OC Register. There was a lot of coverage media, on this. Coverage yeah, on there it. was. It was a big thing. There was. You know, and my good name, you know, I was my good name was being ran through the mud. Man, I was guilty in the court of public opinion from the from the gate. From the gate. Everybody, oh, he's guilty. Oh, that's suspect. That video looks horrible. Yeah, it looks horrible, but it's not what it seemed. Right. Now that we're breaking it down, I'm giving you perspectives yeah. on perspectives on it. It makes sense. Right. You get me? I wasn't doing anything inappropriate. Right. And it was proven. And thank you. I'm done. You're done. This I'm is, done. This, I didn't want to even come and do this platform no, with you, I, I, but I felt a sense of, hey, I owed it to everybody. Because they're getting one side from outlets like Insane Throttle, where, which are not reporting it properly. And he's being one-sided because he's getting Joe Yanni in his ear and he wants to stay in the good graces of the club. Yeah, I think and that... And for what? You're supposed to be fair, impartial, and objective. And you, can... You're speaking on the biker community. Right. He, he, but I also think there's, there's a group of people out there that just want to see you f- fall face down in the mud right. and they you, you, no matter what paperwork you're a rat dave you know they, they they have there's that narrative and then there's some people on our comment boards that are like if he was innocent he'd sh- shut up and not say a thing I, to the me opposite. it's the contrary it's like if 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 i if you are guilty you tuck your tail and run and crawl under a rock but if you're innocent, man, you are filled with your belly's got you've got fire in your belly, and you're like, man, I'm I'm gonna vindicate myself. I you're had you're, to. you're actually fortunate that this happened in a weird way that right. that that motion was filed, because if there was any little thing in there, it would have been uncovered, and you would have been crucified. Right. You know what I mean? It basically removed all doubt in my eyes. Because the amount of people that the government put on, this is a problem. Like, the government put on everybody witness from law enforcement. And here comes Joe Yanni putting on people that are reluctant to get on the stand. They don't want to even be there. They have the fucking, the poor brother Boogie go up and testify to the same shit I've already testified. Oh, I've seen him talk to Sacconi. And then you'd walk away, they'd be done. Yeah, thank you for corroborating that information because I've already said it and everybody else has said it in over a hundred testimony, but over a hundred brothers witnessed you talk to Sacconi. Always. always. I mean, he'd pull up when you guys are chilling. Yeah. Uh, What did the court call your brothers behind you when Sacconi would pull up? What would they call what they called him like your security team or something? Oh yeah. Yeah. Like, cause every time I, you know, I, because of my position, I always yeah. had brothers around me pulling security. It's just a, a matter of formality and respect. I never wanted that entourage. I don't feed into that egotistical yeah. type of program. But, 
it was just out of sheer protocol yeah. and respect that they did it. And I never wanted, I always, I kept it down to a minimum, one or two brothers. Uh, plus I'm very private and I keep yeah. my circle tight. Um, that's the way I do things, you know? But just being cordial and respectful towards law enforcement don't mean that you're being inappropriate and ratting on your club brothers. And I had no motivation. What was my motivation? Was it my cases? No, nope. nope. can't be because there's been yeah. dispositions on all of them but one because I'm going to trial on another one or whatever, But or we're going to figure that one out soon. But there's nothing there. There's, there's nothing there's there. There's no there over there, man. Yeah. yeah. And they keep talking about, oh, you got busted with a gun and Nicholas. No, that's Bobby D pushing that narrative into fucking the ear of uh, Insane Throttle and Joe Yanni. I never, and I showed my paperwork. It was dope and it wasn't even my dope. It right, was, it was your another club. Yeah, 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 come on, man. Like, bro, you guys keep beating the same dead fucking the, horse. There's just nothing there it's a rap. over there. Yeah, it's a wrap. You've been totally vindicated. Shout out to Gil at American Cholo for right. for at least making that statement and yeah. saying, hey, look, I I doubted Dave too in the beginning. We sorted through the facts. And and real street guys and people that live by the G code, they exactly. know paperwork is your driver's license, bro. Exactly. And you know if I ran into a bunch of homies on the dude, I always run into homies, like because I still kind of run in a circle where you know, hey, yeah. they're acquaintances of mine. They're cool. I'm good with them. And everybody, we, we believe you, Dave. And they, they, they were like, fuck that. You don't have to go on them fucking show and prove. Fuck these people. I just want to let the public know and everybody know that, hey, you know what? It's, it, it, it was a straight up fucking railroad job. And you know what? Like I, like I said before, I'm not mad about it anymore. I, I feel yeah. like they did me a fucking favor. Yeah. Um, I'm in a better position. I feel better about myself. I'm just glad the weight's been lifted yeah. off my shoulder. I've gotten so much closer to my family, my kids, my wife, my grandkids, everything, that I'm doing stuff that normally I wouldn't be able to do Right. just because I was so busy yeah. with the club. You know what I and mean? And that's the sad shame is you were such a good brother, man, such a solid representative of of what the new biker culture was right. turning into in the world of ring cameras and cell phones. You know, the, you have like you said earlier in our first interview, you have to adapt or you die, you know. And, you know, a Annie had a really neat quote, and and it's it's live, learn, and teach. Mm -hmm. And that leads me into my next kind of uh, question for you is, what does the future now hold for you, little Dave? Are you going to, I, I heard rumors that a book is coming out. Is that true? Yes. Okay. <laughs> And how is that? How has that process been? What like it's it's going. Um, I I I just want. I I've been journaling. Um, it's it's going good. You know, I, I have a really good memory, and 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 if I can't get the dates, I go through old emails. You know, of events we hosted as the club. Um, you know, you know the the big topics. Obviously, the case. Um, all the work I put into it. Yeah. It was my baby when I started to save the patch. I did it for everybody. And I just want to make something clear because Insane Throttle doesn't get it. He doesn't get the the law on it because there is no law on it yet. You know what I mean? It's going to set case law. Right now, we're at the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Now, I watched George Steele because you're able to do it for the Ninth Circuit. They have a YouTube feed through the federal courthouse, the Ninth That's Circuit cool. Court of Pasadena. So I actually watched him in action. It was closing. It was uh, oral arguments, you know, regarding the appeal on it so george Steele went on the government went on they had 15 minutes each and it looked like the three panel of judges the women they were getting it finally they got it and all that's left that's at stake on the table right now are the exclusivity rights of the patch of the trademarks you can't take them away from our club because they're collective membership marks they're not like corporate marks like ibm or google or right. Coca-Cola or whatever. So right now, all it is is exclusivity rights. So at this point, everybody's, it's not the domino effect anymore. If they take our patch, they're gonna take, they're not taking our patch. That's not, that's not what that's we're not getting. That's not at stake. That's not what's at stake. It's at stake is who's gonna control the marks. Now, if the government controls the marks, guess what? The, the, these t-shirts, full patch t-shirts could end up in Walmart and we can't have, a, we can't have a word to say about it because then the uh, infringement part of trademarks don't exist anymore because the government has exclusivity rights to it now. 
So, so the HA, the Vagos, the Bandidos, the Outlaws, the Pagans, safe. they don't have to, they're safe. Yeah. So stop with the fucking, fucking bad information, causing pandemonium. Right. It's not going to happen. Yeah. We are safe. Thanks to your Even, advocacy, Dave. Yeah. You, you put your neck out there, man. And my neck and my face your for the time, last 13 years, yeah, my bro. time, my efforts. And to be thrown out and discarded like trash is bullshit. It's, it's a I shame. I never got my day in court, still in limbo. So that's how I leave it. You know, now they're afraid that I'm vindicated. Now what's that? Oh, the money. I have, I can refute all the money too, because the they too. email me. My treasurer, my secretary had always emailed me what we have in the kitty and stuff. I have that, all that paperwork. That's easy to I look brought at. it with me. And the reason I don't show it, because it's club business. Yeah. And I'm not going to put the club in that Th headlock. That's club business you get straight me? up. So they could continue to smut me and question my integrity and throw me out there like I'm some fucking pile of shit thief. Or say, oh, he only makes 40 grand a year on his bail bonds business. Man, fuck, I make that on one bond sometimes. You yeah. get me? And uh, I mean, I'm dabbling in other businesses right now in the cannabis industry, right, right. and that's why I just leave it at that. You right. know what I mean? No, you've. So yeah. I got a good business partner, and we're doing good right now, and everything's good, and I'm happy. And one of the things I want to say is it's like, if my style, I mean, if my, uh, my style, my, um, Management my uh, style? lifestyle was oh. being uh, funded by, you know, money from the club. It's still the same lifestyle. I have all the same cars, live in the same house 15, 16 months later. I haven't been evicted. I'm not on a plane going to fucking Tennessee on a witness protection program. I still live in the same spot with the same cars. It's just like, yeah. come on. My lifestyle is supported by my own income. It wasn't by the means of the club money. Cause trust me. Yeah, Dave, you were always known for having dough, man, since you were yeah, 19 come years on, old. Bro. Everybody, you were always balling, man. And and yeah, no, it's it's a it's a it's a shame, man. It's, it really it's is. It's a when sad you, shame when you boil it all down and you, and and you know once that you know you have this this smut that's been lifted off you. I've noticed, you know, the comments have been like, man, I you know a lot of a lot of thinking men sat back and they analyzed it, right? And so people have been waiting for this vindication or the otherwise. Oh yeah, right. They're sitting back with their arms folded, waiting, and you've been proven to be a solid dude man all the way through you never ratted on this club you never betrayed this club you right. loved this club so much so that you were you almost threw away your family over this club you know when it comes down to it speaking of that how is your relationship with annie and your family getting better i just touched on it everything it's a work in progress you know a lot of healing right you know um it's uh Taking a lot of effort on my part, you know, obviously there's a, some resentment issues. And both ways. It goes both ways, you know, and resentment you're right a, to, yeah. you're right to say that, you know, and uh, I, we're just trying to be as private as possible and moving forward, just trying to get this Good. whole thing in my rearview mirror and move forward. You know, I'm 52 years old, bro. Like I'm not getting any younger. You're a grandfather. Yeah, I'm a grandfather. And, uh, you know, I've been spending a lot of quality time with my grandkids, which I love doing where before I was, fuck, I was just running and gunning and yeah. drinking and, you know, doing my thing and being a part of this uh, crazy lifestyle. You know, I'm not about this lifestyle anymore. You know, my, my desire is not even there anymore. I'm not going to lie. It's just, it's been slowly dissipating as time goes right. by it's just it's just like i don't i don't have a desire to be around the club anymore and it's a good thing i mean i know you miss uh, your brothers i do some of them but oh. the real brothers the gangsters and the real ones they know they what know. time it is they know you get me yeah. and just because there there were there was elections recently and the same people were on top it's all good no problem you know what i mean like welcome to my nightmare you take the headaches now it's not the good with the bad i'm out you get me and at the end of the day like i said they did me a favor so i just want to leave it at that i i wouldn't i would never say anything bad about the club or make any disparaging comments or anything uh, this club was good to me for years it's just not a part of my life moving forward anymore and i just want to get it behind me bottom line right a lot of people that reach your level of success, they want to contribute back to society in a positive way. Do you have any plans for that? I do actually. Um, 
And one of the things I want to do is work with, 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 with the youth, you know, do like some youth outreach programs. And one of the uh, places I want to tackle is Central Juvenile Hall, Eastlake, because uh, you know, shit, I did a lot of time in there growing up as a youngster and I did, you know, some camp terms. So I was just like, I get it. I get the program, but I want to save them before they get up to the level leagues, of adulthood yeah. and, and catch them. Uh, adult yeah. uh, adult probation or parole and, yeah. and now you're in the system right now you're embedded now you're lost you know and uh you know you only want to catch them at their youth before they start bad habits start forming and they're going to be harder to break and you know you start to become institutionalized you know my little nephew donji done for like four four or five terms wow. you know he caught in the system he just got out and now he's he lives in uh in nevada because out here, everybody's just, there's too much temptation. You get me? Yeah. So I just want to prevent, <laughs> right. do some preventative stuff right now because of COVID and because a bunch of issues going on. They're like close shit at, at Central because I was talking to Bandit about it. Yeah. And he told Shout me. Shout out to Bandit. Yeah. And uh, he's, he's heavily, uh, you know, a big advocate for the kids and everything. So I want to go down that road. I feel like, well, what? Yeah, man. If there's, I mean, between you and Bandit, man, you guys can probably reach more more guys yeah. than anybody else, man. He, he grew up in the same neighborhood as my old lady. You yeah. know, I grew up there as, you know, I didn't, I wasn't living there, but I grew up in that right. environment, that neighborhood. You know, Because all my down. friends were from, you know, from that neighborhood and stuff. So we have a lot in common, me and Bandit. So, uh, you know, we're just sharing some stuff. That's awesome, man. Yeah, but I want to go down that road and, you know, just yeah. help out at what, any which way I can, especially with the youth. Do a give back and, yeah. yeah. No, I love sure it, Dave. Right. There's other stuff, you know, but I'm just going to take baby steps and, you know, just keep pushing forward and, you know, just keep doing me. So, little Dave, these are some users. Um, submitted questions uh from our loyal subscriber base and um pop a collar brawler <laughs> right pop a collar brawler i love that writes i want more details with the laughlin river run incident between the mongols and the hell's angels also when the mongols went up against another organization he touched on it a little but can he go further I won't touch on that organization. I know who he's talking about. I, I don't talk on, I don't speak on that organization ever. Um, and I'll talk about some HA stuff. I'll talk about Laughlin is fine. Okay. But I won't speak on that other organization. Okay. Dave, talk, talk to us. There, there, a, a video was released by, uh, I think, Doc Cavasso's son. Yeah. And it, it, it's, a, it's a video of the Laughlin run and you see Doc Cavazos and some Mongols start to square up with some HA guys. And in the video that's, I guess, highly edited, it shows you parting right in the in the screen. And the suggestion is that, oh, little Dave is, is running from conflict. He's running. Right. Um, and, you know, we talked about this, and there's, there's two approaches when a fire starts, right? Some people run to the fire. And then others um, get the tools necessary to fight a fire, the hose, right. the ladder, right? Where were you running to during that video? Well, first of all, I just want to make mention that in 2007, uh, see, you can only get that video if you were part of the case. So it's discovery, right? So the only one access to the video were the, the seven defendants, which were all brothers. And Doc Cavazos, because he was the uh, uh, president at the time when that incident occurred. Or he actually, uh, Roger Penny was. However, after the discovery came out, Doc was the president. So they were privy to all the discovery information. So what they did was, because Doc ran, his son ran, Al the suit, the brother ran, uh, they were trying to deflect off of them running and not going up to the eight chase like i did initially if you look at the beginning of the video in the frame at right at the beginning i was the one who went in front to confront the hell's angel with roger penny and bronson rest in peace it was me us three we you, went up to you him. were on the initial front lines yeah. the video look, doesn't look the show video. that exactly okay and if it does show it on another uh somebody else they copied that video It'll show me turning around because we were trying not to have an issue. 
Okay, right. it all started because we went up north to San Jose and started opening up chapters. And I told you that was a big no-no. It was Correct. taboo. We should have never done that. And that's what started, restarted the conflict, okay? And what fanned the flame that day was we got to, to fucking the Harris Casino Thursday. Everybody was getting there Friday. So we were low on manpower, okay? The HAs were down the street at the Flamingo. It used to be called the Flamingo. Now it's called the uh, Aquarius. So what happened was, unfortunately, there was like 10, 12 Hells Angel members staying at our hotel. At Harris? Yes. So you know that was going to cause a lot of conflict. So by, the, by that next day, when brothers were barely starting to leave their homes to come in on Nevada to, to Laughlin, we were outnumbered 10 to 1 out there. And what happened was security was getting a little uneasy. So they were telling everybody, hey, no knives, no hammers, no nothing. Take it upstairs. We catch you down here. You're, go you're getting kicked out of the hotel. So we were, we were obliging them, you know what I mean? So a lot of brothers that were carrying shit, you know, I could talk about it because it's public record public now record. because everybody was convicted. It's, it's, it's done. It's done. We had brothers that were scrapped. Well, I didn't have shit on me. Number one, I was on parole. I shouldn't have been there. I was out of, I was out of state. Uh, I had one year left on my term and uh, they can't violate me now. It's been 20 years, 20 plus years, whatever it was. And uh, what happened was a lot of the brothers, it was 2.30 in the morning when the shit kicked off. Brothers were asleep. Drunk. Drunk. Brothers were barely coming into town. What happened was we had Nextel radios and another thing I impl implemented for the club. So I remember we, we, those, the yeah, little chirp, had, they're, the two, they're way. two yeah. ways. Yeah. yeah. So that's when you see great. me on the phone. That's why I'm chirping. One of the people I was able to get a hold of was Mike Munts. He was coming in, but got blocked off when the shit was kicking off. They blocked off both entries into Laughlin, Nevada on the Arizona Bullhead side and on the California side. So they're like, Dave, you guys are on your own. It's like, fuck, man, we had no shit on us. Right. So when the shit kicked off, when, well, it hadn't kicked off yet. I turned around because the brother Bolo had a fucking small little ax and he pulled it out. So what's that going to start? A fight. World War Three. Yeah. yeah. And then Raymond Folks, H.A., was already getting hot, coming in. They were coming in. Not only were they were coming in through the front door, they were coming on the backside from us, ready to ambush us. It was us an ambush. Because they were coming on the ferry, the boat that runs alongside the, the Colorado River to right. all the casinos. Right. They had helmets on, bats, fucking hammers, ready, ready to, to get busy. Yeah. So we were out number 10 to 1. So when the shit started kicking off, I told Bolo, I great full kick back, dude. And it, he took me away from that situation. I was right. sending, sending them back. And then after I was on my phone, I couldn't hear it because it was a two-way and it was on speaker. So you could hear me walking back and forth trying to hear it. And then Doc got in front of me. Right. But Doc was the first one to run out of the way. And they cut that part. It's edited. Well, that's the whole irony. Look this, at the timestamp on it. Right. So what happened was that was in the restaurant. I was holding the elevator to get on the elevator. I had TNT, Chamaco, and Horatio. We all went upstairs, took off our patches, came back down with Just shit. Some Billy Westerns. And guess yeah. what happened when we come down? The cops swarm it. Right. I had a knife. It was not a big deal. The brothers had a strap. They got busted. Right. So after. Bro, I've never ran from shit. You I, ask any of my brother, have. how many fucking barroom fights? Bro, I fought three cases. One in Pasadena, saw with the deadly weapon for getting busy with some brothers that were being disrespected. And I jumped in and the fucking, I caught a case over it. I caught a case in fucking Palm Springs. I got a case in fucking Santa, Santa uh, Anita, Anita Racetrack no, where a brother yeah. pushed my brother-in-law's brother-in-law into that. a wall of glass. Yeah. And I got busy there. And I, I've never, the club knows that. No. You, so why do you think from 2007 when that video surfaced, Doc trying to deflect from me, I, that's a throw out offense if you run, you get me? Right. So I was never thrown out no, because, because it was all bullshit. Yeah, no, it was all went, smoke yeah. and mirrors to deflect off of what Doc did. He ran. And, and, and Dave, you know, most people wouldn't believe you, but the fact of the matter is, is who gets hogtied and belly chained in a banquet hall with a you and not doc right so what happened was when we came back downstairs all oh, law enforcement came in some brothers got away luckily through the other door well, because we came back down the elevator right. and come out the first floor where as soon as we you broke get in, you get tackled we yeah. get boom everybody's yeah. on the floor so you have 
one banquet room full of Mongols, another banquet room full of HAs, another banquet room full of civilians. From 2.30 or 3 in the morning, we were uh, zip-tied, and then probably weren't able to go to the rest, and weren't able to do shit, we were being detained, no water, no nothing, people were just spread out, knocked out, and then they finally broke loose on the, on the zip ties and put belly chains on us. And we were able to go to the restroom, bro. When they were some of the old ladies, I felt really bad. They cut those zip ties because your hands are wrapped behind your back so long. People were losing sensation in their fingers and hands. Right. It, it was bad, bro. It was a bad scene, man. It was a they released us finally after almost 12 hours of being in a bank room. And guess where they released us? Into a van. Halfway out, they were trying to take us out of to the, the fucking the, California side and they say, check this out. You leave us here, we're sitting duck. These fools come up on us, we're done. Right. We have no phones. They took our phones. We have no means no to protect weapons, yourself. No nothing. Yeah. Nothing. Right. So it was a bad situation. But everybody that knows me, I got bit, bro. I got well, at one of Bobby D's concerts, the brother of trouble got stabbed and I got busy. I fucking broke my hand. I got a fucking had a house. No, stitches. everybody knows you're down bro, for I, your I shit. I get busy, bro. I hey. don't ever run from shit. Yeah, Dave, and the, the thing I want my audience to know is that that video in its entirety was reviewed at Mother Chapter. 2007. 2007. Right. All the brothers saw that. Yeah. So so that's all. Uh, the, 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 the brothers know that wasn't the case. You weren't running exactly. from conflict. You were going to get the tools necessary to fight the fire. So we, they all know that. It's just the outsiders looking in go, oh, look, Dave's running from conflict. Dave's not going head up. But that that's that's already been solved internally. So done. That's a that's a wrap. Uh, Jesse Tapia writes: As a club leader, did you ever speak to any Hell's Angels in leadership, or was there never any contact until they would bump into each other and handle business? Great question. And I have pictures. Let me back up. So I was heavily involved. They reached out to us and I welcomed it in 2011. We started doing four on four talks, okay? I could speak on it because some of the guys passed away, one of natural causes and one got killed, Steve Tossin by his own people at the gravesite when they were burying uh, Jethro Pettigrew in yeah, uh, San Francisco. That was national news. Yeah. yeah, it was actual news, so I'll talk about that. So it was a four on four. It was, uh, it was me, Chago, uh, Junior Erickson and uh, Red Dog. We did a four on four meet. It was all, I facilitated the whole thing because I was a sitting president at the time. And I thought, hey, it would be good after fucking three decades of warring, maybe just fucking put this shit on the back burner because the only ones that are winning are the, are, is law enforcement and the feds. They want us to fight, you know what I mean? Of course they, they do, divide and pot. conquer. Yeah, divide so and it conquer. It is what yeah. it is. So we tried, we had a really good relationship and it was working. But the problem with the HAs, they're, they're like, their individual charters are ran independently let me, of its own. Let me let my audience know that in, you know, some clubs have a central leadership, right? Pyramid structure. A pyramid structure. Other clubs have, each chapter has their own president exactly. and can make their own call. Exactly. And so you had no real, there was no one to liaison with. Exactly. You'd have to piece up with these individual chapters, basically. And that's what the public doesn't know. They don't know that. So so, it, so to answer your question, Jesse, and thank you for the question, bro, is that Dave tried to do uh, just little little meetups and, and bury the hatchet and piece up. Unfortunately, because Steve Tossin passed away, uh, Cisco from the Hells Angel passed away, and they, these are long, long, Cisco was a member for like 30, 40 years. These are some heavy hitters. They're, they're, they're movers and shakers within the organization. Influential HA guys. 100%. Yeah. But it. because we have a pyramid structure, one guy on top, you could turn the switch on or off right. anytime. Right. Which, which is a blessing and a curse, right? It, thank you. I was just going to say that. It really is. Right. But the problem with dealing with the HAs is that they like to shift blame. Oh, it wasn't Ventura, it was Riverside Chapter. Or it right. wasn't Arizona, right. it was It was those Colorado. guys, yeah. But, but it's also smart of the HA where they can't, you they can't, can't prove recode. Yeah, right. Exactly. No, it's, 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 it's got its ups and downs to it do does. that structure. But, it does. But uh, Dub, Dub the come up, shout, shout out to Dub. He's a loyal uh, watcher and he's been monitoring this uh, very closely. 
Um, and he D- Dub's done some prison time. He's he understands yeah. the politics. Yeah. I want to Dub writes. I want to know what he thinks when he looks in the mirror. Like, was it worth it? All that time, effort, ink, putting in work, bringing the Mongols to a household name, all to be left out to the wolves as a supposed snitch. Mm-hmm. <sighs> was it worth it? I I, I gave have my life to this club uh, 25 years um blood sweat and tears the last 13 years starting that movement and fighting the federal government and being where i'm at it was worth it in a sense it was part of my journey in life but it's behind me now and you know it was fun while it lasted i had a great run and you know i wish the club would have appreciated me a little more and it's not the club it's this administration i just want to reiterate that it's sad that it's come to this because it, it'll never be what I, what I took it to a level and it'll never, it's not sustainable. I mean, it, it is just an extent, but it'll never be the way I had it because you have to put a lot of time and effort. And I didn't do it by myself. I led the charge with a lot of good brothers and you know, they let, they let, they let a lot of brothers go too when, 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 when I went, right. when I went out the door too. good, good brothers that supported me. So, right. I mean, was it worth it? Yeah, in the long run, it was part of my life, you know. It was just, it's a part but of your I'm past. Done. It yeah. exists. Yeah. But we're moving on to greener pastures. It, it, exactly. Um, a different calling. Right. Vegas Prison Stories, who has a cool channel. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. Can I get your thoughts on the recent Vagos Hells Angel incident, Memorial Day weekend in Vegas? I don't, I don't really want to speak on any, any, any other organization's problems or existing problems or if they're doing their thing, I, I, I just, I'm not going to speak on them. Okay, cool, man. Yeah. All right. Um, that fair enough. And, and, you know, sometimes that's a, a different situation. Yeah. Um, okay. And then we got, um, um, Jorick 220 commented. Can Little Dave participate in more interviews on different platforms to give advice on life's challenges, such as life lessons, advice, etc.? He's a down-to-earth guy and seems knowledgeable. This is Jorick220. Yeah, um, those are my plans for the future. I, I just want to let everybody know I'm never going to speak on this. I don't. I don't give a fuck if Insane Throttle talks more shit about me or drags my name through the mud more, it's it's done. I've been vindicated. It, it's a wrap. He, can, he can't take my, he can't steal my thunder from me. I'm good. And I just want to move forward on a positive tip That's from this right. point forward. No more discussion about PMA, this. positive mental attitude. That's right. We're moving forward, baby. No, f- no more NMA. I love it. We're done. I love it. Underscore uh, FR3D commented, do you think MCs have fallen away from brotherhood and its core values? Does it seem to be something they promote and preach yet actually, yet don't actually follow through? Does it seem like everyone's out for theirs and trying to do, trying to just outdo, outshine their brothers? That's a tough one because when you're in it and you're living that lifestyle, you, you you know the you know those are your brothers you know they're gonna back you it's like family you know they're always gonna have your back but unfortunately lines get blurred due to politic issues and people jockeying for power I mean you got chapters that are like eight to ten guys and if they don't like the current president then they're gonna rally and fucking campaign to get him out so you could get the it's not a popularity contest guys. That's not what this is about. It's about who's the best guy for the job. Right. You get me? And unfortunately, that's what happens, you know, at times. Right. You know, lines get blurred and shit don't happen the right. way it should. Right. Uh, Jork220 continues to say, he, he goes on and says, I don't have any questions in regard to the Mongols or the things that old Dave had to go through, but I love his way of speaking. He seems like a very knowledgeable person. Would Little Dave perhaps consider joining some sort of podcast to discuss and converse about everyday life? I think that would be awesome. Do you have any podcast? Is that or no? Or, you know, well, we, you and I have talked about it, I, and uh, you know, I don't know if that's 
part of my calling or not. It's a lot of work. It is. Bro. Um, it really is. It's a thankless job and until you get going and you have enough subscribers to keep pushing. But honestly, I, I'm still in my healing process. Yeah. And, um, you know, I've got other uh, things that are really a, a lot more uh, important that I need to satisfy now right. first at a more prioritized um, my path moving forward and you know I just I don't really think it's in the stars for me okay. I don't I don't know okay <laughs> fair enough um, shout out to big bad bandit green light California prisons if you haven't checked out bandits podcast it is quite awesome man he's doing a great job he writes with all due respect little Dave I grew up banging and later uh, being enemies with your sister-in-law's man. Yeah. Not going to mention no names because those who know, know. Yeah. I want to ask, is there an entire regiment of Doc? Is that entire regiment of Doc Cavazos he's referring to long gone in the Mongols? I ask because I lost homeboys to his regiment. Could these dudes be Mongols again? I for sure don't consider them my homeboys anymore. Can't serve two masters as the saying goes. OG Bandit, Lowell Street. Yeah. yeah, I'll just touch on that real quick. Um, those I made some really good friends. You know, I know who he's talking about. Those were really good brothers. I caught a case over boxing with those brothers in Pasadena one time, and you know they backed me up and I backed them up. They're solid as fuck. They're 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 gangsters. I mean, they're, they get down, and uh, you know that was part of the doc program. I think what he's trying to refer to the regiment, it was that program is no longer in place. You right. know, the vetting process to come on board with the Mongols motorcycle is very stringent. You know, you have to have a bike. If you're from a neighborhood, you got to cut ties, all the dirty laundry or baggage stays at the door. You don't bring it with us. We make sure cause we do our due diligence. Right. We, you know, we, we make sure you don't have a problem with your neighborhood because we don't want to, because when you become a Mongol, we take on all your problems. You get me? Right. As an individual, because we back you 100%. Right. And so to avoid conflict with any other neighborhoods or higher ups, well, we just, we, we just, we're cool. Like, I know who he's talking about. Yeah, They're yeah. no longer in the club. Right. But, you know, they, they, they were, some of those right. guys he's talking about were defendants in the RICO trial. Right. You and, know, and I, they're, I, they're good with me. Right. They're good with me. And and I and, and I rem I recall, you know, some of the criticisms from what you know one might call the orthodox one percenters, the guys that are <laughs> purists. They yeah. they would say, oh, the Mongols are cholos on wheels. They're not bikers in quotes, like real Harley riding bikers that adhere and subscribe to those that cultural aspect. They so. they've been saying that because of you know <laughs> the neighborhoods we grew up sure. in and in the in the lifestyles that we grew up in in the LA area right. you know the gangster this and that cholos on bikes right. all the negative connotations that go with that like a biker is a biker like you know it's your freedom to ride a bike it's a passion you're driven by the brotherhood um, you build that cohesion being on the road um, that's something you can't take away from anybody. Like it, it's built like you, anybody to say that they don't know our lifestyle, bro. Right. Like, it's a totally like, different shtick, man. Yeah. You know? it's, I mean, it's not what it used to be. Like if you were able to live in the seventies, eighties, nineties, which I was in the nineties, when I came on board, shit's different. Very You've different. got Rico, you know, fuck, fuck the gang enhancements in the state. They don't even do that shit no more. They Rico your ass any chance they get, and the Rico fucking brings ten to life fucking sentences all day long. Little Dave, you know it's funny. We've had we've interviewed so many different walks of life, and all, all these 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 underworld organizations. It's all watered down now. The LCN is basically over, you know. And oh and, yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, we talk to these guys. It's everything's changed, and. Look, man, it is what it is, uh, for the better or worse. Right. Uh, Jason W. three fourteen says, "Hey, I'm from La Puente, now living in Sydney, Australia. Oh, wow. How does it feel to be vindicated, Hefe? It feels really good. I feel like uh, weights have been lifted off my shoulder, and like I said, uh, I kept my mouth shut for the last five six months. I didn't go on any public forums or outlets." I just kind of wanted to let everything play itself out. And I knew I knew the day was going to come when I'd be vindicated. I was that confident because I didn't do anything wrong. Of course. And a person that hasn't done anything wrong or taken the stand or, you know, squealed on a brother or done whatever, we had nothing to hide or worry about. 
it just, you know, just going through the process was tough. I'm not going to lie because you're having to relive and rehash everything every time you go on a court. And it wasn't a good feeling. You know, you're being put on a public display with a bunch of journalists and media uh, people that were in the audience listening to everything go down. And every day you got to relive it every day you're in court. I had to relive it eight different dates, right. you know, but I'm happy that, you know, the truth prevailed. Right. Um, I it deserved it. Yeah. And you know what? It doesn't come out in the wash. Always comes out in the motherfucking rinse. That's right, man. That's right. Um, another loyal subscriber, God's Chosen People, writes, since you know I've been waiting for this one, I really hope my question gets asked. Well, it does today. Would he still wear his club vest when he goes out on his bike? If not by doing so, doesn't that make him look guilty? <laughs> I think, you know, God's chosen people, I, I don't think it's a one percenter, but but I I can only assume you're not gonna fly the wear that vest. I'll be really honest with you, like I have no desire to put on my patch and ride around with it. I have several, including jewelry and uh Mongol paraphernalia, regalia, all that shit. Uh, but my heart isn't into the one percenter lifestyle anymore. It's geared towards my family, my kids, my grandkids, and they've proven to be my biggest support system throughout this whole ordeal. And I gotta give them that respect. Mm. And I'm not, look at bro, 25 years, I didn't get shot on my fucking bike and I'm not doing 20 years of life on a Rico, like a lot of other uh, one percenter, uh, international presidents, national presidents, uh, they didn't do shit the right way and nothing against them, but like any indictment that ever came down in the last 13 years as a president, whether it be H.A., Vogels, uh, prison indictments, I read them all and I learned from their mistakes, mm. learned not to lead yeah. the charge. Fuck the hell's angels do this, kill them, bomb, firebomb their, their tattoo studios, firebomb their clubhouses. No, it's, that's taboo. You can't do that because everybody's on the wire and that's what it brings in indictments, you know? It brings law yeah. enforcement attention when you start doing shit like that. So yeah, I learned a lot. I'm fortunate and blessed not to be dead or in jail. I'm good, bro. You're good. I'm good. Yeah. And your name is good. And my name's, my name's always been golden yeah. in the prison system on the streets. And anybody who knows me, they know. They know and a lot of brothers know. But unfortunately, we have to get over this administration in order yeah. for us to heal yeah. and, and, and get it behind yeah. us. Yeah, it'll come. Um, yeah, I'm not worried about it. If it takes 10 years, I'm patient. Right. I don't care. No, it's all good. I know what I did. I'm good. Right. I've made my peace. Marvelous Minds, shout out to Danny, man. He He's coming from a whole different perspective. You know Danny Ayala, Marvelous Inc., right? Yeah. He, he writes this, and this is coming from his you know, through his lenses, right? Right. So what happens to the dude that accused him all, all, all of this? <laughs> and what are the repercussions of the dude bringing his wife back to Cali when that incident happened in Mexico? He's referring to the Rosarita incident. Yeah, Bobby D. <laughs> Annie was exported out. Yeah. He's, Danny, so Danny's interested on, hey, what, what happens to that fella? See, cause Danny, Danny got, he got brought up old school. You get me? He knows the fucking game. He's a gangster. And anybody who's a gangster and has any fucking uh, a, a good moral compass knows that that was a big no. You don't do that shit. And at the end of the day, bro, dude's still in the club. I can't figure it out. I don't I don't know. I honestly I can't sit here and and figure it out because I don't know what they're thinking. I don't know why they still got them tight. Who knows? Yeah. But yeah, I mean you, we'll, we'll see what happens. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, maybe they're going to learn the hard way because people like that never change. I got paperwork on them. Could you imagine he's fucking singing already on money laundering shit? Could you imagine if they get hit with a Rico? He'd be the first one to fucking, yep. fucking be talking. You get yeah. I me? Mean? Guys like that are weak. They never been a day in fucking jail in their life. Mm. Okay. They lie and want to say they have, but they haven't. And I got the proof right there to prove he's a fucking liar. So Demon from the Sur writes, question, if there's no solid proof or evidence he's an informant, then how the fuck and why the fuck the Mongols did him so dirty? He's an international president. He's been on the front lines fighting for their patch. That's no brotherhood. 
why does he feel the need to have love for the organization that shows him little or none back? I'm a South Sider from Anaheim, and without paperwork or proof of his accusations, then it carries no weight. So that's a real one tapping in. That's that's what I'm talking about. This is the real ones. No, the gangsters. No, the dudes that have done time in, in prison, state or federal, they fucking know. Why do I have love for the organization? Because the organization as a whole didn't fucking throw me out. It was the, the, the betrayal of the people I broke bread with in my inner circle. My administration are the ones that turned on me. And they're the ones that it just put it to this level. I mean, it could have just stopped at that and we wouldn't have to move forward. And he's right, with no paperwork, it's a no fucking brainer. They chose to make this public and disregarded the repercussions because what happened was it ended up becoming a global story because it was all over the press, including New York Times. Right. So I have love for my brothers. I don't have no love for this administ current administration. Right. That's what it's really about. Right. right. Um, Jesse Tapia again writes, ask him why the Mongols can't get a stronghold in the San Francisco Bay Area. It's dominated by Hell's Angels, okay. bottom line. And that was, was that the big point of contention with the HA? That's why the was shit the, kicked the sh off okay. in Laughlin. Yeah. Because we tried going up there. Okay. And it wouldn't work. Okay. Because there's implications of uh, other organizations up there sure. with the whole Southsider sure. Norteño sure. thing. You sure. get me? I get you, man. Thank it's, you. It's heavily political. Thank you. Um, Harley Boy 91, he wrote, does Dave still ride? I don't ride as much as I used to because my desire, my passion isn't there. And I've been super busy doing other things right now that have occupied my time. But yeah, I'll always have love to ride. It's just, right. it's not in just me right now. Weekend warrior stuff or? Just, not, just, this? just not my priority right got now. Got you, got you. Not my pro. I'm just doing a lot of other things right now when you do ride is it is it kind of emotional for you like when i ride i just want to i'm going to pick and choose when i want to ride and a lot of times i like to ride to clear my head and think about shit moving forward like i love going up the coast and uh no music no nothing just a full face helmet just smashing yeah with my visor up and just rolling it's, it's the best therapy it's ever, therapeutic man, man. For those who the haven't best. done it and they don't, they don't know. It's the love of the road, man, the freedom. Yeah. Writing's everything, you know? Yeah. Stephen Thav04 writes, what's his workout routine? That's an interesting one. <laughs> um, That's a tough one. I don't know. It's just like I try to stay disciplined. I try to, try to stay grounded and laser focused on training, but... I hadn't been motivated in a while and I just started going back to the gym recently and I just feel better. I feel better when I train and work out, right. gets the blood flowing, it gets the mind going. And anytime I prepare to come on any podcast or a platform, like I just want to be super focused and say the right things and, and be articulate and, and, you know, be as transparent as possible. So I have to be in the right state of mind to do these things. Right. And working out helps, working out helps. Being healthy and fit helps. Are you doing weights, like free weights, or you do more like burpees? And, no, or... I'm, just, I'm doing a little bit of everything. I do cardio to start, and then I'll do the weight program, and then a little more cardio. But, you know, um, I just went for my yearly physical, and I just, I just got to start eating better because I'm, you know, I'm over 50 now. And, uh, you know, challenging, it's challenging to eat good when you're on the road a lot. But I have to just stay more disciplined on my nutrition now, is what the doc, good doctor told me. Right, right. <laughs> we well, talked about this. Yeah, we did, actually. <laughs> and, and, yeah, it's, man, you're not a spring chicken anymore. Nah, man, and everything just hits you harder when you get older. You feel like an old wrestler getting out of bed, yeah. huh? Stiff. Yeah, you're stiff. You get stiff, yeah. inflammation, all that Plus shit. Plus, I'm really active, so right. it just it makes it even worse, you right. know, being more stiff, getting out of bed and shit. right. Big Murdoch from AK Taproom. Uh, shout out to AK Taproom. It's a great uh, podcast up in Alaska. If you haven't seen it, go check it out, guys. He writes, can you be black, a black man and join the Mongols? 
Yeah, un unfortunately, because of uh, the prison politics, don't allow us to uh, invite. Um, uh, I just I have to say this politically correct. Uh, black writers uh, well, into fair. our yeah. into our club. Right. It's just because you segregate in Cali, and you segregate, you sure. know, and you know you yeah. you you you're supposed to have your brothers back you know and when you run the yard segregating it ain't gonna work right um it's a little different in the midwest and east coast they they they, they co-mingle but you know it's just all about politics sure. man i got a lot of good dudes that i know that would have been great brothers but because they're black it's just not gonna work right because of politics have, 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 some, politics. Have, have some brothers tried to join like some black dudes have, have they asked to join the mongols over the years or yeah yeah, yeah. of course they, they've showed interest yeah and um you know, there's a really good, solid club up in the East Coast that's all black, the Thunder Guard. They're, they're solid, solid as yeah. fuck. Uh, you got the Rare Breed. You know, all these guys, they, they, they've got their own one percenter clubs. Sure they do. You yeah. know, Thunder and, Card, Thunder Card's big yeah. in the East Coast. And, you and got, I got some really good friends from there. They, they all, they've they been reaching out to me, you and, know, yeah. rooting for me. <laughs> right. Shout out to them. And and, yeah. and, I, and I know that over the years, the Mongols have, have always... Uh, you know, coexisted and, and partied with black clubs. Like that yeah. was that you guys would, you, you know, name some of the local clubs in LA. That one down, one down, rare those guys breed. are br heavy, rare yeah. breed yeah. and they're solid dudes, man. And, and they have, you know, I, I was telling Murdoch, they have some of the flyest bikes out, out when I see some them, of man. the best, tell, tell them, tell us about some of the, what the brothers are riding their style. Like they, they, they just like the bagger look with the ten, twelve thousand dollar motors in them. They love to race. They love the wheelie. And I love that shit. I eat it up. I love, I love, I love that shit. Right on. It's man. just ride hard and fast wheelie. Like that's just great. I love it. It's yeah. part of the lifestyle. You know what I mean? Whether you're a 1% or not, a lot of people are turning to that. Uh, lifestyle like because the Harley scene's big right now it you is. know as far as getting on a bike wearing your black leather vest the, the Harley Davidson startup kit yeah right uh, the black leather vest the, <laughs> the do-rag and the fucking and the fucking uh bandana I'm, I'm kidding but you know so little Dave man you've been totally vindicated paperwork speaks for itself we've dug all these uh old bones up and um you're you're off and running now man it doesn't look like you will go back to the one percenter lifestyle you've hung up your your vest and you're left with some good memories some bad memories some indifferent memories families intact what's your what's your final message to you know i, I know you're never going to do another media appearance regarding this matter right what's your what's your message to your family your friends people that have supported you during these dark days and 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 the mongol nation the good brothers over there yeah first off you know you when you're when you're going through uh you know some hardships in your life and you know you're going through that struggle and uh you don't know why it's happening or you know you're going through it and trying to get it past you and you know everything keeps popping up and uh i truly believe in I hate to sound cliche-ish, but family, family's always there for you. And uh, when you're down, to support you, to bring you back up. And that's one of the things I felt that, like one of the misconceptions is like, you know, your homies or your brothers are supposed to be there when you're down, at your worst point in your life. And I just felt, you know, this is supposed to be a brotherhood but yet they're kicking you when you're down. It was like the ultimate betrayal. And that's the thing that gives me heartburn is because it shouldn't have been that way. I didn't teach the club to be this way. You know, they were been my students for years, the youngsters, you know, and um, it was just disheartening to see it happen in that, in that manner, in that shape, you know, and, you know, I'm just moving forward, but I'm glad and I'm fortunate and blessed to have my family that had been with me ever, you know, they could have took their mom's side and, you know, kicked me to the curb and, you know, and they just stood there and kept it, kept it going for me, you know, kept me, uh, su kept supporting me and just my light at the end of that tunnel just to keep moving forward. And I just appreciate everything they did for me. People that came, I hadn't talked to people in years. People I grew up with on the streets that were calling me, you know, my homie Tater's sister, they, they call me, the 
Buggy calling me, all them people I grew up with that don't give two shits who I was or my status. They give a fuck of who I am. They know who I am. They see me grow up as a little kid. And those are the people that reached out and, and really helped and supported me throughout this hard throughout this hard time, you know, that I went through. Yeah, you get to see who your real friends were. Yeah, you got to see who's who, you know, right. and you know the ones you thought that were gonna always be there. <sighs> They took tail and ran or ghosted me and shit. I'm like, I'm good. Thank you. See ya. I, I don't need friends like you. You get me? Like, I have my family. So, you know, it was, it was, it's tough. It's still tough, you know, just getting over this whole situation. But I'm getting through it. I'm learning to deal with it. Know, I'm finally acclimating back to normal. You know, when you're running a mile a minute and you hit a brick wall, you know, it, it's hard. It's just like you have to reintegrate yourself back into society, start acting normal, you know, have start laughing and having fun again. It took a while, but I'm getting there and you know, time time heals everything. That's right, man. Little Dave, we want to thank you so much for sharing this whole story. It's a wrap. We feel so good about your vindication because you deserve it, bro. Thank you. Appreciate that. Love you, man. Love you too, man.